All right, managerial accounting students, chapter 12. Do you realize we only have three chapters to go? Chapter 12, 13, and 15. We're skipping chapter 14. It's not required material for the course, so we just have three chapters left. We're on the home stretch. So today we'll get into chapter 12, differential analysis, the key to decision making. And we've talked about differential analysis a little bit in the past. Um, We've talked about the idea of relevant and irrelevant costs. Some of these cost concepts go all the way back to the beginning in chapter one. Um, the idea with relevant and irrelevant costs is that only the things that differ between two alternatives matter. So um, six concepts to get us started on the chapter. Um, first, key concept one, every decision involves choosing from at least two alternatives. Therefore, the first step in decision making is to define those alternatives being considered. Um, oftentimes in textbook land, we're just comparing option A versus option B. But a lot of times in the real world, it's really option A versus B versus C versus D versus all the other things that we didn't even think of. Um, but in textbook land, we'll often just simplify it down to two alternatives, but it's good practice. Uh, key concept number two, once you've defined those alternatives, you need to identify the criteria for choosing among them. And that starts with relevant costs and relevant benefits, which should be considered when making decisions. And then we want to ignore the irrelevant costs and irrelevant benefits. So things that don't differ between the two alternatives would become irrelevant and they don't matter in your decision making. Key concept three, the key to effective decision making is differential analysis, meaning focusing on the future costs and benefits that will differ between the alternatives. Everything else is irrelevant and should be ignored. So the things that don't differ are irrelevant and therefore should be ignored. A future cost that differs between any two alternatives is known as a differential cost. Future revenue that differs between any two alternatives is a differential revenue. And then we have an incremental cost is an increase in cost between two alternatives. Or uh, finally, an avoidable cost is a cost that can be eliminated by choosing one alternative over another. Key concept four, sunk costs are always irrelevant. Sometimes that's a hard one to get our brains around. A sunk cost is something that have, has already happened. It was incurred in the past, and therefore there's not anything that we can do to change it moving forward. So the key is understanding that sunk costs are past tense. They al already happened, and therefore they're always going to be irrelevant because they were in the past. Finally, key concept number five, future costs and benefits that do not differ between alternatives are irrelevant to the decision-making process. So if they don't differ, then they're irrelevant and they don't matter. And lastly, key concept number six, opportunity costs also need to be considered when making decisions. An opportunity cost is the potential benefit that is given up when one alternative is selected over another. And we've talked about opportunity costs before. Um, they're very important in terms of our decision making in business and in life for that matter. But in terms of accounting, we don't record them in any way. So they're relevant and they should be considered in our decision making, but there's no place to record opportunity costs in our financial statements because it's the cost of what you didn't do. It's the potential benefit that we're giving up. So here we have an exercise in identifying relevant costs. Uh, we have Cynthia, a Boston student, is considering visiting her friend in New York. She can drive or take the train. By car, it's 230 miles to her friend's apartment. Hmm, guess how many miles it is coming back from her friend's apartment? Another 230 miles. So round trip, it's 460 miles. I wish they would just say that. She's trying to decide which alternative is less expensive and has gathered the following information. So Cynthia has somehow gathered all this information about uh, her car and the cost of operating her car. So she's got annual straight line depreciation on her car of $2,800, which that breaks out to, I think it says uh, 28 cents per mile. Yes, 28 cents per mile. Uh, cost of gasoline, she's got at 10 cents per gallon. Um, it seems nice and low, but 
not 10, sorry, not 10 cents per gallon, $2.70 per gallon, which is 10 cents per mile, still low. Um, annual cost of auto insurance and license, $1,380. And she's broken that out on a per mile basis, which is interesting to me. So she's got 13.8 cents. Um, maintenance and repairs, she's estimating six and a half cents per mile, so 0 0.065. Parking fees at school, this one perplexes me, $360 a year, but she's broken that out on a cost per mile basis. Wait, 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 hold on. First of all, let's start with Cynthia may not be the sharpest student we've ever met. Cynthia still has a lot to learn, it seems. How many miles are you driving when you're parked? Mm, I'm gonna go with zero. So not quite sure why she's breaking out her parking fees at school on a per mile basis. But anyhow, these are the numbers that Cynthia came up with. So she thinks the average cost per mile is 61.9 cents per mile. So 0.619 per mile. Um, already I'm questioning some of her numbers here. They seem a little strange. Um, I am a bit curious about why she's computed straight line depreciation on her car, but nonetheless, she's done it. Um, more information. Um, okay, we looked at all those, and then we have additional information. Reduction in resale value of car per mile of wear. So every mile she drives, she thinks it's gonna reduce the resale by 0 0.026. The round trip train fare is $104. The benefits of relaxing on the train trip as opposed to driving, hmm, priceless. Uh, we're not sure, but there is a benefit of relaxing on the train. We just don't know the dollar amount. Uh, cost of putting the dog in the kennel while gone. Well, is she gonna kennel the dog either way? Let's assume yes, that she's going to travel and kennel the dog either way, that the dog isn't going to go on the trip with her. Uh, benefit of having the car in New York. Mm, there could be some benefit, but we're not sure. It actually could be a hassle, which leads to number 12, hassle of parking the car in New York, probably huge. Per day cost of parking the car in New York, $25. That actually seems pretty low for New York. Um, so that's all the data that she's put together. We need to kind of sort through that and figure out how to use all that information to make a decision. So let's figure out what's relevant in her decision making. The cost of the car is sunk and therefore not relevant to the decision. So she didn't include the cost of the car in there, but she did include depreciation, which is systematically allocating the cost of the asset over its useful life. So we need to consider that the depreciation is potentially a sunk cost. It's the allocation of that sunk cost and not relevant. The annual cost of insurance is not relevant. It will remain the same if she drives or takes the train. She should insure her car either way, right? However, the cost of gasoline is clearly relevant if she decides to drive. If she takes the train, she would avoid the cost of the gas, and so that would differ between the alternatives. Uh, the cost of maintenance and repairs is relevant. In the long run, these costs depend on the miles driven. However, oh, has suspected, the monthly school parking fee is not relevant because it must be paid if Cynthia drives or takes the train, and it really shouldn't be broken out on a per mile basis, Cynthia. So what we can see right now is that the cost that Cynthia came up with, the 0.619 per mile, is not entirely accurate. Part of, part of it is relevant, part of it is not. What else counts? The decline in resale value due to additional miles is relevant. Keep in mind that that is different than depreciation, right? Depreciation is not a decline in value. Depreciation is systematically allocating the cost. So here they're talking about the resale value, which is different than the cost. Um, the round trip train fare is obviously relevant. If she drives, that cost would be avoided. Relaxing on the train is also relevant, but it's hard to assign a dollar value. 
And then the kennel cost is not relevant because she should kennel her dog either way. Her dog's not going on the trip. Um, what else? The cost of parking in New York is relevant because if she takes the train, she shouldn't be paying for parking in New York. The benefits of having a car in New York and the problems of finding a parking space are both relevant um, but difficult to assign a dollar amount. They might in fact offset each other. So if we take what we know um, from a financial standpoint, it seems that Cynthia would be better off taking the train to visit her friend. So let's take a look. Gasoline, 460 miles at 10 cents per mile. It's $46. Um, the additional maintenance cost, 460 miles at 6.5 cents or 0 0.065 per mile, $29.90. Uh, the reduction in resale, 0 0.026 per mile is another eleven ninety six, dollars And then we've got to park the car in the city for two days, and we're coming up with $50 there. So that puts us over the cost of the round-trip ticket. And then, of course, we've got the benefits of relaxing on the train. So um, based on this, it seems like taking the train might make more sense. Um, well, this seems like a really basic decision. The point is looking at what is relevant and irrelevant to the decision. Sometimes we tend either personally or in business to just gather up tons of information and a lot of it doesn't in fact matter to our decision making process. So part of what we learn in this course is figuring out which data does matter in our decision making. How do we use that information wisely to make the best decisions? As we look at decision making, um, there's different ways of doing it. So we've got the total and the differential cost approaches. Uh, total means that we look at everything and differential means that we look only at what differs. So we're looking at this company and they're considering a new labor saving machine that rents for $3,000 per year. Data about the company's annual sales and costs with and without the new machine are here. So either way, we've got sales of 200,000 um, direct materials is 70000 Direct labor, though, is going to change between the alternatives. Currently, we're spending $40,000 on direct labor. But with the new machine, it's going to save us a lot on labor. It's going to automate some of the process. So we save on labor. Um, variable overhead stays the same either way at $10,000. Uh, we keep going. So we've got other $62,000 either way. And then we have the rent on the new machine. So the current situation doesn't have the machine, so it's zero. But if we do rent this new machine, it's $3,000. So we're spending $3,000 here to save $15,000 on labor. So in looking at our different approach, um, when we look at the differential approach, rather than doing all of this work, Right? So the total cost approach, we put the two columns side by side and then we pull out only what differs, which is 15,000 minus 3,000 gives us 12,000. So that's the total cost approach. Um, when we look at the differential cost approach, we ignore all of the rest of that and we just focus in on, okay, labor cost is going to decrease 15,000, so we save 15,000 and our fixed rent expense is going to increase 3,000 and so our financial advantage is 12,000. 15,000 minus 3,000 is 12,000. Now we come up with the same answer either way, but the differential cost approach was clearly much faster. We also didn't look a at a lot of the other numbers that might kind of clutter our decision-making process. So in using the differential approach, it's often desirable for two basic reasons. One, they say rarely will enough information be available to prepare detailed income statements for both alternatives. Um, I would just say not always is there enough information. I wouldn't say it's rarely. We clearly have the information here. Um, but secondly, mingling irrelevant costs with relevant costs may cause confusion and distract attention away from the information that's really critical. So when we look at this, there's, most of the numbers on this page don't matter to our decision making. And their point is we should really just hone in on the two numbers that matter, 15,000 minus 3,000, and that's it. So that's total versus differential. So next we're going to look at 
making decisions about whether a product line or a business segment or some, some kind of segment should be added or dropped. Typically we say uh, keep or drop. So we're looking at keep or drop decisions. Um, this is a big decision, whether we want to keep or drop a business segment, whether it's a product or a certain segment, um, but that's a big decision to make. And we need to make sure we're doing it very carefully and considering the relevant information. So we're gonna look at this example. Due to the declining popularity of digital watches, Lavelle Company's digital watch line has not reported a profit for several years. Lavelle is considering whether to keep this product line or drop it. And the basic decision rule, Lavelle should drop the digital watch segment only if doing so would cause profit to increase. So only if profit would increase. Lavelle will compare the contribution margin that would be lost if the digital watch line was discontinued to the fixed expenses that would be avoided if the line was discontinued. So we'll look here, we've got uh, sales of 500,000, and then we have our variable expenses, so variable manufacturing, variable shipping, commission, so all of that adds up to 200,000 and a contribution margin of 300,000. So making watches is contributing $300,000 to the company's profit, but we have a bunch of fixed expenses as well. So then we've got general factory overhead, 60,000, salary of the line manager, 90,000, depreciation, 50,000, advertising, 100,000, rent is 70,000, general admin is 30,000. That is a lot of fixed expenses. We have $400,000 in fixed expenses, and therefore we're ending up with a net operating loss of negative 100,000. So I can see why management is considering whether they should keep or drop the digital watch segment. Nobody likes losing $100,000 $100, year after year. So clearly something needs to be fixed in here. The question though is how much of those fixed expenses are actually traceable to that product line? So an investigation, sounds very serious. An investigation has revealed that the fixed general factory overhead and the fixed general administrative expenses will not be affected by dropping the, the digital watch line, meaning those expenses are going to exist either way. The fixed general factory overhead and general administration expenses assigned to this product would be reallocated to other product lines. Wait, 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 okay. That's really important information. And what that means is this $60,000 of general factory overhead and general admin expenses down here, they don't even belong there. Those expenses don't belong to the digital watch segment. They were allocated here. Those are common fixed expenses, not traceable fixed expenses. So the first thing we learn is don't trust the income statement that they put in front of you. You need to question everything. They need to provide you with more information because what we find is that on these income statements, they tend to mingle together common fixed expenses and traceable fixed expenses. And then they tell us about it after the fact. So what we know is that this 60,000 of general factory overhead doesn't actually belong here. It's gonna be reallocated to another segment. So this is not going to go away just because we drop the digital watches. And the same with general admin. That 30,000 is not going away just because we dropped the digital watches. It's gonna be reallocated elsewhere. Uh, furthermore, the equipment used to manufacture digital watches has no resale value or alternative use. So essentially they're just gonna throw that machine away um, or that equipment away. So the question remains, should Lavelle retain or drop the digital watch segment? The contribution margin approach, we compare the $300,000 of contribution margin that would be lost if we get rid of the digital watch segment. So that's minus 300,000. And then we compare that with the cost that would be avoided. So the salary of the line manager would be avoided, the advertising would be avoided, and the rent for that factory space would be avoided. 
So we would save 260,000, but we'd be giving up $300,000 of contribution margin. And therefore the disadvantage of dropping the digital watch line would be negative 40,000, which means that by keeping it, we make 40,000 more. Let me go back for a moment. There we go. So we're comparing only the cost that would be saved. So we know general factory overhead is gonna be reallocated elsewhere. So there's no cost savings there. We would save money by not paying the $90,000 salary. What about depreciation? Does that even belong in our decision-making process? Depreciation is the allocation of a sunk cost. So it doesn't belong here. So we ignore the depreciation. We would save $100,000 on advertising and we'd save $70,000 on rent. So if we take 90, 100, and 70, those are the numbers they're coming up with here. Notice that we ignore the cost, they're gonna be reallocated elsewhere and we ignore the depreciation. And what it tells us is that we should keep the digital watches. Um, we can do this by looking at our comparative income statement as well. Let's look at it that way. So if we keep the digital watch segment, these numbers all stay the same. If we drop, then all of that goes away and we have a difference of negative 300,000. So if the digital watch line is dropped, the company loses 300,000 in contribution margin. Down here, uh, the general factory overhead would be the same under both alternatives. So the company is still stuck with that 60,000. It might just be shifted to a different segment, but we're still stuck, stuck with it. The salary of the line manager would disappear. So that is a difference. The depreciation is a sunk cost. Also remember that equipment has no resale value or alternative use. So the equipment and the depreciation expenses associated with it are irrelevant to the decision. So therefore we count it as being the same under both alternatives. Um, the advertising, that would go away. The rent on the factory space, that would go away. So those create differences. And then the general admin expenses, um, that is, uh, that's gonna stay the same. It's gonna be reallocated to a different segment, but the company's still stuck with it. So ultimately what we see is um, a difference of 40,000 over here. So right now we're losing $100,000 on the segment. If we discontinue the segment, we lose $140,000. It actually makes things worse by not having the $300,000 of contribution margin. Um, but again, it brings me back why did we include, why did they include the general factory overhead and the general admin in this computation to start with if those are common fixed costs? But that's a common error in the, in the business world is to allocate fixed costs to different segments. So um, while we know it doesn't belong there, it's something that you might see all the time in the real world. So be aware that allocated fixed costs can distort the keep or drop decision. Lavelle's managers may ask, why should we keep the digital watch segment when it's showing a $100,000 loss? And the answer lies in the way we allocate common fixed costs to our products. First of all, those words are like nails on the chalkboard to me. We shouldn't be allocating common fixed costs to our products. There's that's not correct in terms of our managerial accounting. So including unavoidable common fixed costs makes the profit line appear to be unprofitable when in fact dropping the product line would decrease the company's overall net operating income. So ultimately the answer is keep. We wanna keep this segment. Next, we're gonna look at make or buy decisions. So when a company is involved in more than one activity in the value chain, it's what we call vertically integrated. So meaning if they make some of their own parts that they end up using in their manufacturing process, for example. So a decision to carry out one of those activities in the value chain internally, rather than to buy those parts externally from a supplier is called a make or buy decision. So when we talk about vertical integration, so choosing to make some of our parts internally, 
um, the idea of vertical integration is that it has the advantages of hopefully a smoother flow of parts and materials, hopefully better quality control if we do a good job at making it. So these are, these are all kind of if we do a good job and hopefully we would realize more profits if we do a good job. Um, there's also a possibility that we do these, that we uh, take on vertical integration, making some of our parts internally, but we don't do a good job. So that would kind of cancel out any of these advantages. Um, when we talk about vertical integration, there's definitely disadvantages as well. Companies may fail to take advantage of suppliers who can create economies of scale advantage by pooling demand from numerous companies. So economies of scale is that idea that when we make lots and lots of a single product, when we do something in mass, in bulk, that we do it more efficiently and probably at a better quality. So if we're able to uh, obtain parts from an outside supplier that makes a million of those parts a year, they're probably pretty good at making those parts and they do it repeatedly, consistently, and they've probably got their costs down as low as they can. If we decide to make those parts ourselves and we only make a thousand of them a year, we may not be nearly as good nor efficient at making those parts than an ex external supplier might be. So we're gonna look at this example with Essex Company. Um, Essex Company manufactures part 4A that is used in one of its products. The unit product cost is as follows. So we've got direct materials, direct labor, variable overhead, depreciation of special equipment, supervisor salary, and general factory overhead. So we've got a total unit product cost of $30. So like the keep or drop decisions, the first thing I'm gonna do is warn you, don't necessarily use their numbers. There might be some numbers in here that don't belong. Is there anything that pops off the page at you yet? Well, let's find out some more information. The special equipment used to manufacture part 4A has no resale value. The total amount of general factory overhead, which is allocated on the basis of direct labor hours, would be unaffected by the decision. So the general factory overhead is still going to exist. So it's essentially just going to be reallocated elsewhere. So that raises the question, does it even belong in our unit product cost? It's simply an allocation. Um, and it's not going to go away. So it's not traceable to each unit that we make. The $30 unit product cost is based on 20,000 parts produced each year. An outside supplier has offered to provide the 20,000 parts at a cost of $25 per part. Should the company stop making part 4A and buy it from the outside supplier? Well, if we go with the original numbers here, they say unit product cost is $30 and an outside supplier saying we can do it for $25 per part, well, that sounds like a great deal. But hold on, slow down. What about that general factory overhead? Does it really belong in there? Maybe we need to look at our numbers again. So let's try this another way. So our cost per unit, they're showing the $30 here. If we're gonna make 20,000 units, now they did this based on 20,000 units. I think I would have broken it out on a per unit basis, but that's fine, we can do it this way. They're saying it's 20,000 units times $9. It costs $180,000 in materials. 20,000 times $5 of labor is $100,000 on labor. Our variable overhead would be 20,000 units times a mm -hmm. dollar per unit. And that would be $20,000 of variable overhead. The depreciation of the equipment doesn't count. That's a sunk cost. So that doesn't count. The supervisor's salary, that does count. 20,000 units times $2 per unit is 40,000. And then they already told us that the general factory overhead is going to be reallocated somewhere else if we don't make this part. So it honestly doesn't belong here. It belongs in a common fixed cost not assigned to each unit of product. So the cost of making those 20,000 units is really only 340,000. Um, and then the cost to buy it, 
20,000 units times $25, that would be 500,000. So clearly making it is still less expensive than buying it externally. So um, in this case, while this unit product cost of $30 per unit seemed high, uh, once we pull out a couple numbers, we pull out the $10 here and the depreciation of the equipment there, that brings us down to $17 per unit times 20,000 is our 34, 340,000, which is far better deal than buying it externally. So the avoidable costs associated with making part 4A are the direct materials, direct labor, variable overhead, and the supervisor's salary. The rest of it is irrelevant. The cost incurred to buy the equipment, uh, depreciation of special equipment, that's a sunk cost. So again, we don't count that. Um, it's not an avoidable cost. So the depreciation simply spreads the sunk, sunk cost over the equipment's useful life. So that systematically allocates the cost of the asset over its useful life. So what you're going to find, again, depreciation is not relevant in our decision making. The allocated general factory overhead represents allocated costs common to all items produced at the factory and would continue unchanged. So therefore it's irrelevant to the decision. It never should have been included in our unit product cost. And so we arrive at the conclusion that the financial advantage of making part 4A rather than buying it externally is $160,000. Now in the real world, this question would be combined with Okay, so if we're making part 4A, is there another part that we should be making internally instead of 4A where we'd save even more money? Do we have the capacity to make more parts internally? Or maybe we should make part 4B internally and we should outsource 4A. So in the real world, this is often complicated with other decisions of what should we use that capacity to make and what would be the best idea financially. Um, which ties into the idea of opportunity cost. If we decide to make part 4A internally rather than getting it from a supplier, are we giving up the opportunity of making part 4B or 4C internally? Though opportunity costs are not actual cash outlays and are not recorded in the formal accounts of the company, an opportunity cost is the benefit that is foregone as a result of pursuing some course of action. So if the space to make part 4A had an alternative use, the opportunity cost would have been equal to the segment margin that could have been derived from the best alternative use of that space. So if we could have made more money by making part 4B rather than part 4A, we would need to reconsider our decision making because opportunity costs matter. Analyzing special orders. So we need to decide if we should accept a special order. What's a special order? Well, when we say special order in this course, we're referring to a one-time order that's not considered part of the company's normal ongoing business. And we consider only the incremental costs and benefits. So when analyzing a special order, only the incremental costs and the incremental benefits are relevant. Since the existing fixed MO costs would not be affected by the order, they're not relevant. So we figure we're going to incur the fixed MO either way. Whether we accept the special order or we decline the special order, the fixed MO is going to be what it's going to be. And therefore, it should not be considered relevant in our decision-making process. So let's look at an example. Jet Inc. makes a single product whose normal selling price is $20 per unit. A foreign distributor offers to purchase 3,000 units for $10 per unit. Whoa, that's like half price, right? So we normally sell for 20 per unit, but this foreign distributor offers to purchase 3,000 units for $10 per unit. Hmm. This is a one-time order that would not affect the company's regular business. Annual capacity is 10,000 units, but Jet Inc. is currently producing and selling only 5,000 units. Okay, so big picture here. Jet Inc. is operating at half capacity. They're only, they're only operating at 50% of their capacity, 5,000 units instead of 10,000 units. And they've got this foreign distributor that wants to buy 3,000 units, but at a deep discount. So Jet Inc. might 
financially be in a situation where making the sale of 3,000 extra units that they weren't otherwise going to sell might be a great financial opportunity for them. So while it seems like $10 per unit is too low, we do need to consider this. So we definitely need more information. So as it is right now, um, we've got 5,000 units times $20. So our revenue is $100,000. Our direct materials are $20,000. Direct labor, $5,000. Manufacturing overhead, $10,000. And our marketing costs are $5,000. So the total variable cost comes out to $40,000. Now, if we break that down on a per unit basis, that's $8 per unit in variable costs. And then the contribution margin is 60,000. So the other $12 per unit is contribution margin. And then we have fixed mo, fixed marketing. So our total fixed costs are 48,000 and our net operating income is only $12,000. So potentially this opportunity to sell an extra 3,000 units might be financially wise for us. So let's take a look. If Jen accepts the order, the incremental revenue will exceed the incremental costs. In other words, net operating income would increase. So the incremental revenue would be an extra $30,000, but our incremental costs would just be 3,000 units times our $8 per unit variable cost. The rest of it should be ignored. So we only look at the variable costs. So 3,000 times eight is 24,000 in incremental costs, and therefore the financial advantage of accepting the special order is $6,000. An important note down here, this answer assumes that fixed costs are unavoidable and that variable marketing costs must be incurred on the special order. Um, a lot of times when we look at these special orders, they tell us that the marketing cost doesn't even count. So in that case, we'd be making even more money Per unit. So if we didn't have to do any marketing, then we're really just looking at direct materials and direct labor and the variable mo, and we kick out the $5,000 of marketing costs. So that would make it even more profitable if that's the case. So let's try this one. You've got your calculator, your pencil, a piece of paper. Let's problem solve here. So Northern Optical ordinarily sells the X lens for $50. The variable production cost is $10, the fixed production cost is $18 per unit, and the variable selling cost is $1 per unit. A customer has requested a special order for 10,000 units of the X lens to be imprinted with the customer's logo. This special order would not involve any selling costs, so we can kick out the $1 per unit, but Northern Optical would have to purchase an imprinting machine for $50,000. What is the rock bottom minimum price below which Northern Optical should not go in its negotiations with the customer? In other words, below what price would Northern Optical actually be losing money on the sale? They have ample idle capacity to fulfill the order and the imprinting machine has no further use after this order. So it's like a one-time use $50,000 machine that they're just gonna throw away. Now I'm just saying they should probably just stick that imprinting machine in a closet and not throw it away just in case something happens in the future. But how do we analyze this? So they want 10,000 units. What's our actual incremental cost of those units? So we've got variable production cost. Does that count? What about the fixed production cost? Now they broke it down on a per unit basis. Just because they broke it down on a per unit basis, does that mean it really should be expressed on a per unit basis? Do you think we'll incur more fixed production costs if we take on this special order? Mm, yeah, not really. So we're looking at our $10 cost and then we've got variable selling costs, which they told us that we're not gonna incur any selling costs so we can kick that out. But then we've got this $50,000 machine so if we take that $50,000 machine and we divide it up by 10,000 units, how much is that? $5 per unit? So really our cost would be 
$10 of variable production costs, and $5 toward the imprinting machine. So our cost per unit is really $15. Hmm, that looks like maybe answer C. Here's how they did it. They did it in total rather than on a per unit basis. So they take their variable production costs, 10, excuse me, uh, yeah, it was 10,000 units times $10 is 100,000. The additional fixed costs would be 50,000 for the imprinting machine. So the total relevant costs are 150,000. They divide it up by 10,000 units. That's $15 per unit. So that's the same $15 per unit we were talking about. We just got there a different way. So as long as we charge more than $15 per unit, we're actually making money on this deal. So Northern Optical, as long as they charge more than 15 per unit, they should do it. So it sounds like an enticing special order to take on. So next we have uh, constrained resources. We need to figure out the most profitable use of a constrained resource. A constrained resource is a resource that we don't have enough of, meaning like a bottleneck. Um, there's different terms for that, a constrained resource or a constraint, a bottleneck, um, all the same idea. So sometimes companies are forced to make volume trade-off decisions when they do not have enough capacity to produce all of the products and sales volumes demanded by their customers. In these situations, com companies must trade off or sacrifice production of some products in favor of others in an effort to maximize profits. So when a limited resource of some type restricts the company's ability to satisfy demand, the company is said to have a constraint. The machine or process that is limiting overall output is called the bottleneck bottleneck, it's the restraint. For those of you that were reading the goal, either for extra credit or for the honors option, um, remember the book is actually uh, titled The Goal, A Process of Continuous Improvement. And in that book is where they build the idea, the author, um, Dr. Eliyahu Goldratt, builds the idea, the concept of the theory of constraints. And with the theory of constraints, what we want to do is identify the constraint or the bottleneck and find a way to mm -hmm. elevate or relieve that constraint. So we focus in on that constraint and how to, um, I guess, free it up so it's more, it's more effective. We can do more with it. So if it's a machine, how can we move parts through that machine faster? Or can we buy a second machine? Or could we rent a machine from another company? What can we do to relieve that constraint? And um, so that's part of the process of continuous improvement is identifying that constraint and then elevating the constraint and then operating at a higher level. So here we'll look at the util utilization of a constrained resource. So fixed costs are usually unaffected in these situations. So the product mix that maximizes the company's total contribution margin should ordinarily be selected. So again, that's an important point. The product mix that maximizes the company's total contribution margin should ordinarily be selected. So maximizes the total contribution margin. Um, so what does that mean? A company should not necessarily promote those products that have the highest unit contribution margin, but instead the total contribution margin will be maximized by promoting those products or accepting those orders that provide the highest contribution margin in relation to the constraining resource. So another way of saying that is the highest contribution margin per unit of constrained resource. So let's practice that. Here's an example. In sign company produces two products and the data are shown below. So we've got very creative product one and product two. The selling price per unit for product one is $60. It's got variable expenses of 36 and therefore a CM per unit of $24. Well, product two sells for $50, has variable expenses of $35 and a CM per unit of $15. So based on that, ordinarily we'd say, well, it's more profitable for us to sell as much of product one as we can because it has a higher contribution margin per unit. 
But in this situation, we have a constrained resource, so we need to be very careful how we consider it. So current demand uh, is 2,000 units of product one per week and 2,200 units of product two per week. So the contribution margin ratio is 40% for product one and 30% for product two. So that's just another way of saying the same thing. Um, we've already computed our contribution margin per unit. And here they're expressing it as a percentage. Um, that's nice, but here's the kicker down here at the bottom. The processing time required on machine A1 per unit. So the processing time required per unit is really what matters. Remember, this goes back to we need to look at our contribution margin per unit of constrained resource. So our constrained resource is going to be time on machine A1. And they're saying product one takes one minute per unit, where product two takes 0.5 minutes per unit. So machine A1 is the constrained resource and is being used at 100% of its capacity. There's excess capacity in all other machines, but machine A1 has a capacity of 2,400 minutes per week. Hmm, hold on. Let's go back. We only have 2,400 minutes per week but we have demand of 2,000 units of product one and 2,200 units of product two. How long will that take? So 2,000 at a minute each, well, there's 2,000 minutes, and 2,200 at a half minute each, that's another 1,100 minutes. So to satisfy the demand, we would need 3,100 minutes. We don't have 3,100 minutes, we only have 2,400 minutes. So they want to know, should Ensign focus its efforts on product one or product two? Well, how many units of each product can be processed through machine A1 in one minute? Product one was going to be one minute per unit, but product two is a half minute per unit. So two can be processed per minute. So that's answer B. One unit of product one per minute, two units of product two per minute. So remember the key to answering these types of questions is figuring out our contribution margin per unit of constrained resource. So part 2B, what generates more profit for the company? Using one minute of machine A1 to process product one or using one minute of machine A1 to process product two. Now we know product one has a higher contribution margin per unit, but what about per minute? Product two is only $15 per unit, but if we can process two of them in a minute, hmm, then that makes us more money, right? So in one minute, we could process one unit of product one which is $24 of CM. But in one minute, we could process two units of product two. So two times 15, that would be $30 of contribution margin per minute of time on machine A1. So we wanna focus our efforts first on product two. The key is the contribution margin per unit of the constrained resource. So per minute, Product two is gonna make us $30 of CM per minute, while product one only makes $24 per minute. So Ensign should emphasize product two because it generates a contribution margin of $30 per minute of the constrained resource relative to $24 per minute for product one. And Ensign can maximize its contribution margin by first producing product two to meet customer de demand and then using the rest of its capacity to produce product one. So this is how we would utilize that constrained resource. We take 2,200 units times a half minute. So we're gonna use the first 1,100 minutes for product two. And then we've got uh, 1,300 minutes available after we've finished product two, right? 2,400 minus 1,100, there's 1,300 minutes left. So we're gonna use that remaining time to produce 1,300 units of product one.
So according to the, to the plan, we'll produce 2,200 units of product two and 1,300 units of product one. So our contribution margin is going to turn out like this. 1,300 of product one times $24 per unit, 2,200 of product two times $15 per unit. So the total contribution margin for Ensign will be 64,200. So that's how we maximize our contribution margin when we have a constrained resource. The next part is figuring out the value of obtaining more of the constrained resource. So for example, if Ensign had the opportunity, how much would they be willing to pay for an additional minute of machine A one time? Increasing the capacity of a constrained resource should lead to increased production and sales. So we've identified that bottleneck or that constrained resource and we're gonna find a way to elevate it and that might be by seeking additional machine time externally or buying another machine. We'll have to see what options are available. So here's the idea. The additional machine time would be used to make more units of product one, which had a contribution margin per minute of $24. So Einstein should be willing to pay up to $24 per minute to obtain more machine time. This amount equals the contribution margin per minute of machine time that would be earned producing more units of product one. That seems like a lot, $24 per minute. But when you think about how valuable that is for the company and how unfortunate it is to have a constrained resource and not be able to satisfy the demand of customers, um, they need to consider all of their options. So whether that's renting a machine or buying machine time from a neighboring company, um, they need to consider what they need, what they can do to elevate that constraint. So let's try this quick check. We've got Colonial Heritage and they make reproduction colonial furniture from select hardwoods. So they've got chairs and tables. So the selling price per unit for chairs is $80 per unit. Their variable cost is $30 and it takes two board feet per unit and the monthly demand is 600 chairs. As for tables, the selling price per unit is 400, the variable cost is 200, and the board fee is $10, excuse me, 10 feet per unit, not dollars, 10 feet per unit, and the monthly demand is 100 tables. So the company's supplier of hardwood will only be able to supply 2,000 board feet this month. Is this going to be enough? Well, I'm gonna just take a wild guess that the answer is no, that is not enough. Otherwise, we wouldn't be looking at this problem. But let's do the math on it. So uh, 600 chairs times two board feet, there's 1,200. And then 100 tables times 10 board feet, that's another 1,000. So we need 2,200, right? So the answer, of course, is no. We actually need 2,200 board feet, but we're only gonna be able to buy 2,000 board feet. So we're gonna come up short by 200. The company's supplier of hardwood will only supply 2,000 board feet. What plan would maximize the profits? Well, let's go back for a minute. We're jumping ahead a bit. Um, what plan would maximize the profits? So our constrained resource is board feet. And we want to convert our contribution margin into contribution, contribution margin per board foot. So if we look at the chairs, we've got uh, sales minus variable. So 80 minus 30, we have a CM of $50 per unit. But how much is that per board foot? $25, we take the $50 CM divided by two board feet and our CM per board foot would be $25 per board foot. How about tables? Selling price per unit is 400 minus variable costs would give us a CM of $200 per unit, but then we divide that by 10 board feet and our CM per board foot would be $20. So which one should we make first? Which one do we prioritize? We wanna make the one that offers the highest contribution margin per board foot. So we're gonna make the chairs first. So we'll make all 600 chairs, and then what will be left? 
So in looking at our answer choices here, we've determined that we're going to make all 600 shares because it has a higher contribution margin per board foot. So we'll make the 600 shares first. Can we make 100 tables? No, we already determined we don't have enough capacity to make 100 tables. So what's left is another 800 feet, 800 board feet, which can be used to make 80 tables. The math looks like this. So we walked through this top part mentally. Did you follow me as we went through? We came up with our CM per unit of $50 per chair and 200 per table. And then we divide it by the board feet and we get a CM per board foot. $25 per board foot for chairs, $20 per board foot for tables. So we'll start by producing all of the chairs, which is gonna take 1,200 board feet. And then what's left is 800, which we'll divide up by $10, excuse me, 10 board feet per table. So that's 80 tables. So that's how we get answer B. So the next question, so assume the company follows that plan. We make the 600 tables and then we make, excuse me, 600 chairs followed by 80 tables. Up to how much should Colonial Heritage then be willing to pay above the usual price to obtain more hardwood? Well, the question becomes, what will we be making with that wood? We're going to be making the rest of the tables. First of all, this is a pretty serious problem that we can't uh, satisfy the demand for the tables. Because who wants to buy chairs if they can't get the table that goes with it? It's kind of a problem. So we should be highly motivated to find a way to obtain more wood to satisfy the demand of our customers. And they wanna know how much should, should we be willing to pay above the usual price? Because the usual price is already built into the calculation. So how much above that should we go? Well, what are we gonna be making with it? More tables. So we should be willing to go $20 per board foot above our regular price. The additional wood would be used to make tables. In this case, each board foot of additional wood will allow the company to earn an additional $20 of contribution margin and therefore profit. So um, up to $20 extra per foot to obtain more wood, and that'll allow us to satisfy our customer's demand. When we talk about constraints or bottlenecks, um, it's often possible for a manager to increase the capacity of the bottleneck, meaning relaxing or elevating the constraint um, in numerous different ways. If you read the goal, you saw them experiment with different ways of um, elevating that constraint, which was a machine in their factory. Um, here's some of the ideas that you may have seen. Um, working overtime, so maybe adding extra hours or even adding another shift of workers on the bottleneck machine, if, if it's a machine or if labor is your constraint. Um, two, subcontracting some of the processing that would be done at the bottleneck. So subcontracting it out to an outside vendor. Uh, three, investing in additional machines at the bottleneck. A lot of times that's a great idea, but it might take um, you know a lot of money to buy this extra machine. So. Sometimes a company needs a little while in order to make that big decision. Uh, number four, shifting workers from non-bottleneck processes to the bottleneck. And we saw them try that in the goal where they got more workers to help load parts into the machine. Uh, number five, focusing business process improvement efforts on the bottleneck. What does that really mean? Um, so focusing on operating as efficiently as they can, coming up with new ideas and ways to improve the flow of, uh, for manufacturing something, the flow of parts through that machine. And again, in the goal, we saw them tinker around with different ideas there. And then finally, number six, reducing defective units processed through the bottleneck. And what that means is essentially having a checkpoint before we run units through that bottleneck machine, if that's what our bottleneck is. Um, so that way, if there's something that's already defective or damaged before it gets there, we're not wasting capacity on a product that's already defective and therefore is going to be thrown away. So we'd want to have an inspection point before the bottleneck machine. So those are all ways of managing our constraints. 
So next we have joint products and we need to figure out whether we should uh, sell those products at the split off point or process them further. This is kind of a different concept that you may not have thought of before. Um, in some industries, not all, two or more products known as joint products are produced from a single raw material input. So the point in the manufacturing process where those joint products can be recognized as separate is what we call the split off point. A decision as to whether a joint product should be sold at the split off point or processed further is what we call a sell or process further decision. So for example, um, we have a joint input and it has all these common production processes. Um, that joint input, in this case, in their example here, um, we're talking about the petroleum industry. So for example, in the petroleum refining industry, a large number of products are extracted from crude oil. So that would be our joint input, including gasoline, jet fuel, home heating oil, lubricants, asphalt, and various organic chem chemicals. So we've got the joint input and all these common production processes, which are probably a lot of money, and then we have a split off point where that raw material can now be recognized separately as oil, gasoline, or chemicals. And we need to figure out, are we going to uh, sell it or process it further? So for oil, we'd have separate processing and then we sell it. Gasoline, it can be sold. Chemicals, separate processing and separate product costs. And then the final sale. So the joint costs are the ones that are incurred up to that split off point. So when we talk about making this sell or process further decision, joint costs are traditionally allocated among different products at the split off point. Traditionally, a typical approach is to allocate joint costs according to the relative sales value of the, of the end products. Um, this type of treatment is often what we see on financial statements, so on our balance sheet. So although allocation is needed for some purposes, such as balance sheet inventory valuation, this type of allocation is very dangerous in decision making. So this might be what's required of the company for their financial statements and their financial accounting. But as we found in the past, our financial accounting doesn't always lead us to the correct decision making. Sometimes we need to look at the data in a different way to make these types of internal decisions. So joint costs are irrelevant in decisions regarding what to do with the product from the split off point forward. Therefore, these costs should not be allocated to end products for decision making purposes with respect to sell or process further decisions. It is profitable to continue processing a joint product after the split off point so long as the incremental revenue from doing such processing exceeds the incremental processing costs incurred after the split off point. So what they're telling you is ignore all of this and all we want to do is compare the selling price with the so the incremental sales price with the incremental costs. Okay. So that's all we're going to do. So don't let all of this prior stuff, all these joint costs already incurred, clutter our vision here. So here's our example. Sawmill Inc. cuts logs from which unfinished lumber and sawdust are the immediate joint products. Unfinished lumber is sold as is or processed further into finished lumber. Sawdust can be also sold as is to gardening wholesalers or process further into presto logs. So we're cutting logs and selling lumber, but it also produces sawdust as we do that. So we need to figure out what we're gonna do with these products and should we sell them as is or process them further. So the sales value at the split off point for the raw lumber would be $140 and for the sawdust would be $40. If we choose to process further the lumber, if we process it further into finished lumber, it would sell for $270, but we'd have, um, now ignore the allocated joint product costs. They've already told us we can ignore that. So skip that row. 
the cost of processing further would be $50. So the decision we're looking at, right now my unfinished lumber would sell for $140 per log. If I spend $50 more, I can then sell it for $270. Should I do that? Uh, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Let's look at the sawdust. I could sell it now for $40, but if I spend $20 to process it further into Presto logs, I can now sell it for $50. Hmm, should I spend $20 to make an extra $10? No, I don't think so. So here's that analysis. So we simply compare our final sales value after further processing with the sales value at the split off point. So for the lumber, it would sell for $130 more. For the sawdust, it would sell for $10 more. And then we subtract our cost of further processing. And we see that to further process the lumber is a financial advantage of $80. To further process the sawdust would be a disadvantage of $10. So we shouldn't do that. So the lumber should be processed further and the sawdust should be sold as is at the split off point. So that's it for sell or process further. Make sure that you ignore, the key is to ignore those allocated joint product costs. They don't belong here. So that's the key. Just look at the incremental sales and the incremental costs. A, B, C and relevant costs. So you remember back to activity-based costing they say, they say ABC can be used to help identify potentially relevant costs for decision-making purposes. Um, that's a really interesting point. If we think back to the chapter about ABC, we really took a different look at what causes costs to happen and what's relevant and irrelevant. We didn't use the terms relevant and irrelevant, but we considered all the different types of costs that go into producing a product or serving a customer or having this other product line or making each unit of product. And we looked at it in a completely different way than traditional accounting encourages us to do, um, which is very useful in terms of decision-making and understanding what's relevant. Now that said, managers should exercise caution against reading more into this traceability than really exists. So in the ABC chapter, we did acknowledge that we shouldn't use ABC to make say like a keep or drop decision. But trying in trying to understand if a cost is relevant um, to making a certain product or serving a customer or making um, um, more units of a given product, uh, it does help us understand what's relevant and irrelevant. Um, but we do need to be extremely careful when we're handling traceable costs versus common costs and that allocation of those common costs. People have a tendency to assume that if a cost is traceable to a segment, then that cost is automatically avoidable, which is untrue. I would say usually if something is traceable to a segment, that it's avoidable. Um, these words are usually, they usually mean one and the same, but especially in this chapter, before making a decision, managers need to decide which of the potentially relevant costs are actually avoidable. So if we drop a segment, which of these costs will actually go away or would they be reallocated somewhere else? So that's it for chapter 12. Um, I know that was actually quite long. It's a lot of mini topics within the chapter and individually, none of those topics seems really hard, but the reality is just because there's so many different topics and ways of making decisions in this chapter, chapter 12 tends to be a challenge. Um, we need to stay on our toes mentally and keep focused on what those decision rules are and what's relevant and irrelevant to each of our decisions. Um, of course, feel free to contact me if you need any help on your homework or make use of the chapter 12 discussion board um, to get help from me or your classmates on your homework. Um, you guys know where to find me. Good luck.